So we are making our way through the tissue known as blood, and uh, we've already talked about the red blood cell, the erythrocyte, and, and development of erythrocytes through the process known as erythropoiesis, and we're going to move on this morning to leukocytes. So leukocytes, also known as white blood cells, are actually going to be in very low number in blood under normal physiological circumstances. Uh, in fact, if we measure the number of cells or count the number of cells, there's about 5,000 to 10,000 normally in a microliter of blood, which I know that sounds like a lot. That's actually a very small amount compared to red blood cells. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot of red blood, uh, white blood cells, leukocytes. There's actually a very high number in other tissues associated with other tissues, or what I'm going to call in the body. We just named them leukocytes because we found them in the bloodstream uh, initially. And so we said, oh, there's uh, another type of cell in the bloodstream called a white blood cell, or it appears to be white. In reality, they're very high in number in the body. And really, the reason that is, is because for a short amount of time, for a short amount of time, they remain in circulation. And then they move into the body. Yes? Was it 2,000? Yeah, between 5,000 and 10,000 individual leukocytes in each microliter of blood, a much larger number in the body because of the short time that they spend in circulation. So the blood is actually just simply the transportation mechanism for these cells to distribute them throughout the entire body, and then they enter into tissue where they can have an action, where they can impute their physiological function. Now, in contrast to the red blood cell, you'll remember that the red blood cell was actually... The red blood cell was actually uh, devoid of nuclei, of the nucleus, and devoid of other organelles. Uh, these, the leukocytes, are going to maintain the organelle in their mature state. And really, the Organelles that are involved in synthesis of other macromolecules, I'm just going to simply call these synthesis organelle. are going to be very prominent. So we're going to have higher numbers of ribosomes and lysosomes in these cells. We're also going to see that there are some unique characteristics for the nucleus in these cells. So nuclei are going to be prominent, large numbers of ribosomes, and also the um, waste handling body in the cell, the waste handling organelle known as the lysosome. Now these synthesis organelles, they're making uh, a variety of different types of um, macromolecules. Uh, one of the most prominent molecules that's being produced are going to be functional proteins. And these functional proteins, things like antibodies, which are going to be used in the immune response, are continually churned out during infection um, so that we can uh, utilize, fully utilize our immune system. So we need all the organelles so that we can handle those jobs. All right, so we have, as we've already kind of alluded to, different types of leukocytes, and these different types of leukocytes are going to have different types of functions. And we're going to begin here with the granulocytes. We're going to begin with the granulocytes, which are the cells that are um, sort of grainy. You're going to remember that these are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. The neutrophils are 
they are going to be uh, between 60 and 70 percent of our total white blood cell count in circulation. So this is a very large composition of that blood-borne um, white blood cell fraction. Now, the neutrophils are going to come in two different age groups. We're going to have young neutrophils. And these younger cells, they uh, are very noticeable because the nucleus is in a band shape. And these cells, because of that shape of the nucleus, we call them either band cells or stave cells. So here in the picture, what you can actually see, I can't actually draw on it, but maybe I can use my cursor here. These cells, th this structure here, is very band-like. And so this is going to be that name for those young neutrophils that we find inside of circulation. We're also going to have mature neutrophils. And these mature cells, they actually are going to have a slightly different appearance Really what's going to happen here is that band, the nucleus band, is going to, it's going to remain one nucleus, but it's going to begin to thin out to the point where it actually looks like it's multinucleated. So it's going to appear multinucleated. And the nucleus sort of goes through this extension or segmentation process, which we're going to call blebbing. So the nucleus blebs, and we have that bleb or that blob, and then the thin connection where the band or stave used to exist. So you can see one of these uh, segmented neutrophils in this picture here. And if you look right in this area here, you can see that, hopefully you can make that out, there's actually this thin little connection there. So the nucleus, even though it appears to have two different nuclei, it's still just one nuclei, you have those blebs that are connected together. Due to this appearance, these cells are sometimes referred to as polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Here's just another look at that polymorphonuclear leukocyte. Uh, you can see that this one actually has three blebs and ex uh, 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 two thin connectors. Again, still so just one individual nucleus in these cells. Uh, so the neutrophil, the function here, the important function of the neutrophil is to be a bacteria destroyer. So, as you probably can imagine, if it's a bacterial destroyer, what do you think will happen with numbers of neutrophils during an active bacterial infection? Yeah, they're going to increase. So, during infection, we'll increase the number of neutrophils that are present. Now, during a bacterial infection with high levels or high numbers of neutrophils, the individual is in a pathophysiological state called neutrophilia. Now, this is probably a good thing for the most uh, infections because it's going to aid in the ability of the organism to fight off that bacterial infection. 
So neutrophilia isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is pathophysiological because it deviates from the normal physiological condition. Okay, when given eosin, which is a red color, the eosinophils uh, pick that um, that dye up and they appear very red. You can see here right in the middle of this picture, uh, the nucleus is sort of a purple color and then those granules have really picked up that red stain. So this is a, a sonophil. These are going to have a very, very low number in our blood. So if we pull a blood sample, very low numbers, we're actually only going to see between 2 and 4% of that total blood volume represented as a sinophil. <laughs> now these cells uh, are very responsive to react to stimuli. Um, and some of the stimuli that we'll actually react to and, and will change will fluctuate between the 2 and 4%, things like day versus night, and even winter versus summer. Uh, so during the night, we actually have a slight increase in the number of asonophils that are present. During the winter time, a slight increase in those numbers as well. So very low in the bloodstream. but we find them in very high abundance in tissues that have exposure to the external environment. I'm just going to call those exposed tissues. So high abundance in these exposed tissues. And so these are going to be things like the urinary tract. And let's just call that the UT, uh, the respiratory tract, the RT. So places where you have contact with the external environment, direct contact with the external environment, we're going to find a larger number of these sonophils uh, present. Now these cells, they secrete chemicals. So they produce this secretion, and the, the chemical secretion that is produced is aimed at killing bigger invaders. Uh, so we're thinking uh, in terms of fungi and parasitic worms that may come in contact. So chemical secretions, they basically give this um, dose of this chemical and it begins to just kill and break down uh, that invader, that uh, microorganism, or even a little bit larger. And then the cells will consume the materials, and they actually can be passed on through a pretty intricate physiological mechanism to help out with the immune response, to, to help out with some immunity. And we'll come back and talk more about that when we talk about the lymphatic system. All right, our third cell type here is the basophils, or are the basophils. Again, these are going to stain that very blue color when they get exposed to hematoxylin. Uh, again, very low numbers in the bloodstream. These are on the order of about a half a percent of the total. They are going to secrete another chemical, but specifically it's going to be histamine. So these cells secrete histamine. And what histamine is, is it's a chemical known as a vasodilator. So it's a vasodilator. And what a vasodilator is going to do is it's going to cause the vessels to increase in diameter, and that increases blood flow. 
And we're going to want to do this at sites of infection or injury because we want to increase the amount of nutrients and waste removal capabilities for that area of tissue. So histamine will be released. These uh, basophils will be attracted to those areas where injury or active infection are occurring. Release histamine, cause the vessels in that area to open up, increasing blood flow. I'm going to abbreviate that BF, increase blood flow to the injury, and we will gain some ability to uh, increase the, the, the nutrients and, and waste materials that are being removed. Injury, right down there in the corner. Is everybody good? Did I hear a no? In addition to the histamine, the basophils are also going to secrete another chemical. This time, uh, or this chemical is going to be heparin. Anyone uh, ever had a purple pop uh, tube back container when you've gone to get blood? Have you seen the, um, the purple pop to, to get about five mils of blood? Those are called heparinized tubes, and it prevents clotting. So we actually can produce this naturally. We can excrete heparin at the site of injury, and this will help in uh, reducing clotting and regulate the clotting process. All right, anyone remember what our other type of... Uh, Leukocytes called, we have the granulocyte and the A granulocyte. And we had two types of A granulocytes. The first one is the lymphocyte. And here's a pretty high resolution picture of a lymphocyte. Uh, for our total white blood cell count, we're looking at between 25 and 30 percent under normal physiolo physiological conditions. And the lymphocyte is going to be heavily involved in immunity. So heavily involved in immunity. And we'll actually come back and discuss these later uh, as well when we talk about the lymphatic system and specifically the uh, immune system, which is part of the lymphatic system. The other type of agranulocyte is called a monocyte. And the monocyte is a very large white blood cell. So it is actually our largest of the white blood cells. Can you say like a total, like a total blood? Or? The total uh, of that buffy white coat in the, when we spin our whole blood sample down, about 1%, that 1%, you have, you know, the, the 60 to 70% that are the neutral cells. Okay. So I'm talking about just that 1%, not the, not the total blood sample, but the total white blood cell count. Monocytes are going to be 3 to 8% of that total. In these cells, these cells actually have sort of an interesting looking uh, nucleus as well. The nucleus is a lot of times uh, an oxbow shape. I don't know if anyone's really familiar with that term. Has anyone heard of an oxbow lake before? No? Okay, then maybe I should explain what an oxbow shape is. <laughs> so imagine a river, nice and curvy, and as time passes, the channel of that river switches, and uh, eventually the, the river may actually take a new course, and you'd be left over with these old bends in the river, and that shape there would form an oxbow and we call it an oxbow lake. The uh, monocyte has a nucleus that's shaped very similar to this oxbow shape. 
So observing this under um, a histological prep or a blood smear, it's, it's very obvious because of that oxbow shape. Now, when the monocyte is present in the blood cell, we call it a monocyte. When it leaves the blood, it actually is referred to as a macrophage. I've also heard that pronounced macrophage, macrophage, macrophage. If you parse that word, you got big eater, macro big phage or phage eater. So these are going to be phagocytic cells. So these will undergo that endocytosis um, process known as phagocytosis to pick up large amounts of debris from the tissue, things like foreign invading cells and parts of those cells that have already been destroyed by other immune and white blood cells. So these are going to be cell destroyers. And we're the, the picture you're looking at here, there's a ton of stuff going on here. But you can see that we start with the bone marrow where our white blood cells are going to be generated. They enter into the blood vessel here in the middle of this figure that um, uh, they're now going to be um, macro, or I'm sorry, uh, monocytes. Uh, and these monocytes are going to be named a variety of different things based off of what antibodies and antigens are present on the surface of the, of the cell. And then they enter into the tissue here. And once they get into the tissue, they go through a differentiation process. And we end up um, with cells that are really good extending out those pseudopods, which are going to be the, the extensions of the membrane that can grab onto big pieces of cell to invaginate and pull those, those pieces in uh, and help to basically mop up the mess of an infection or of an injury. All right. Anyone remember what the last component of the uh, of the Buffy coat or the, the white blood cell containing portion of the whole blood sample? Do you remember what that was? It was our platelets, uh, also known as thrombocytes. And these again are fragments of cells. Uh, this is, again, a nice, really high-resolution electromicrograph, uh, and you can actually see some of the organelle that are uh, left over in this platelet. The platelet's not a true cell. It's a cell fragment, and that's why we refer to the, uh, uh, the blood as being uh, a tissue with formed elements rather than a tissue with cells because of the presence of platelets. So these are cellular fragments. not whole cells. Even still, and what's highlighted here in this image, is a very complex internal makeup. It's a very complex internal makeup. We're going to have a variety of organelles that are present. Things like the mitochondria. cytoskeletal proteins for structure. We also have, and, and you can see these, these little white specks here at the, at the tips of both of these platelets. Those are actually going to be granules. And these granules are going to contain, or they're going to be with the secretions the platelet will pour out into the blood clot. So we got granules with platelet secretions that we'll see are used in the clotting process. And then you can't see it here in this figure, but there's actually a, a canal system within the cell. It's a, a, what I'm going to refer to as an open cannulicular system. 
And just think of this as being a series of passageways, a maze through that platelet cell or that platelet structure. We are not going to find a nucleus, so there is no nucleus that is present. Now, these platelets are actually really, really active. They have the ability to confer a large amount of function or diverse functions. And we're going to kind of highlight some of these diverse functions that we receive from our platelets. Things like homeo, or I'm sorry, hemostasis. Don't confuse that with homeostasis. Hemostasis, basically get an inju injury in a vessel, we start to bleed, we are going to undergo blood clotting or hemostasis to stabilize that blood loss. So the cartoon that you can see here, we have a tear in that in that vessel. So the vessel wall has been broken and blood begins to leave the circulation. Red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma, everything begins to leak out. Uh, some of the stuff that's leaking out of these cellular fragments are, are, uh, are platelets. So at vessel injury, the platelets begin to uh, be exposed to the broken vessel wall. And in response to that, they begin to secrete a chemical or chemicals that induce vasoconstriction. So once injury happens and that vessel is opened up, we begin to secrete vasoconstrictors, and this causes diameter of the vessel to decrease. And what's going to be the result there? A decrease in blood flow. When this is ongoing or occurring, this is going to be referred to as a vascular spasm. And it's going to be that vascular spasm that causes the vasoconstriction. And the, the tissue is going to tighten up and will result in a decrease in blood flow. And that's very advantageous because now we've just reduced the amount of blood that can leak out of that vessel. And we're trying to maintain our blood volume. It's very important that we maintain our blood volume. So for someone that has like trouble stopping the bleeding when Yeah, something like going, hemophilia or is it because their body doesn't want to release the vasoconstrictors? Um a lot of those people they have issues with their thrombocytes in the thr or or the thrombocyte might not even be present. Um it could be that they have reductions in in the, the chemicals that get secreted to not only cause vasoconstriction uh, and vas uh, vascular spasm, but also um, that help to induce the clotting and, and the production of fibrin. Now, when you tear open a vessel, there there's collagen that helps to support the, the, the vascular wall, the vessel wall. And when we rip that open, we get these fibers that are present in the, the wall of the vessel. And these fibers actually sort of uh, extend out like little fishing hooks, if you will. And they can catch on and grab on to stuff. And they'll end up adhering platelets. So as the platelets pass through that opening in the vessel wall, we're actually going to have platelets that get trapped. And as more platelets get trapped, this is a positive feedback loop. Platelets get trapped, and more platelets get trapped, and more platelets get trapped, and we form this thing called a platelet plug. And that platelet plug is going to be a physical block <clears throat> against blood loss. We're going to prevent blood loss because we're, we, we developed a physical barrier. Now as those platelets build up, they are good at secreting uh, clotting factors. Remember, they have those granules 
that helped to uh, or that stored up um, factors for secretion. Our, our granules with platelet secretions will be activated and will begin to secrete clotting factors. So we begin to secrete clotting factors and those clotting factors are going to induce a physiological process known as coagulation. In coagulation, we have a protein called fibrin, and this protein fibrin forms fibrous threads. So we get fibrin threads that begin to form a lot like a spider's web around the platelets. So not only do we have that platelet plug in place, but we're also now beginning to um, add structure to that platelet plug. And this creates a very nice barrier, and that's what you can see here in this lower picture. This is a nice barrier that shows fibrin collecting up not only platelets and platelets that are activated, but also red blood cells to help strengthen and increase the um, uh, size of that of that plug. Now the platelets are also going to produce growth factors. And these growth factors are actually going to be involved in repair of that injury. And the growth factor will induce repair of the fibroblasts. So we'll uh, increase the uh, fibrous cartilaginous type tissue that is going to be present in, in the uh, in the vessel wall and also smooth muscle regenerate any smooth muscle that's been destroyed as a result of this vessel injury so again producing these growth factors is an important aspect of repair and maintenance Repair and maintenance of the vessel. Now, eventually, that platelet plug will no longer be needed after we've had for a long time for healing. We're going to want to get rid of it, and it's actually going to be the platelets that help in this process as well. The platelets will secrete clot dissolving enzymes. Uh, and this is, of course, going to happen at the end of the clotting period uh, as a normal physiological response to help in that healing process. The presence of platelets allows attraction of neutrophils and monocytes. And both of these cells are going to act in an in inflammatory response. So this will result in inflammation. And inflammation is going to be increased blood flow to the site of injury. And again, that's bringing in oxygen and other nutrients that help them dispose of the waste products that are being produced. And then last with our uh, platelets, they also have the ability to help and kill bacteria, which is advantageous because many of the injuries that occur are going to be through the integument. They're actually going to be cuts in the skin, which exposes the internal portion of the body and the internal tissue to external um, conditions, which is loaded with bacteria. And so by having platelets that can help kill bacteria right there at the site of injury, we may actually even be able to prevent uh, those uh, bacteria from entering the bloodstream to be distributed to other parts of the body.
So really, that's all I want to say on the blood, give you a background of the blood. And I'd like to move on now um, and begin to talk about the heart. So feel free to start a new uh, series of lecture notes. Uh, and this is going to be related to the heart. Now, the heart, mechanistically, is a pump. It's a type of pump. And pumps move fluids from one location to another location. This particular pump of the heart is going to move blood through two divisions. It's going to move blood through two divisions uh, of the circulatory system. And these two divisions are going to be the pulmonary circuit which is a series of arteries, capillaries, and veins that move blood through the lung tissue. And this is not to support the lung tissue. This is actually for respiratory purposes. Then we have a second circuit called the systemic circuit. And the blood will be moved through the systemic circuit to distribute blood to all of our organs and all of the working tissues in the body. And that actually also includes the, the tissue in the lungs. To support the lungs, we actually have some systemic circuit that goes through the lung tissue. So anatomically, um, we can address the, the heart um, from a variety of different perspectives. The, the first anatomy question I want to deal with is the heart's position. Or the heart's normal position within the thoracic cavity. So you can see here, the heart is technically right in the middle of the body. And it's affixed right here underneath the sternum. However, it is held at an angle, and you can see that we have a long axis of the heart. And then we have two uh, areas of the heart that are of um, anatomical importance. We have the apex, and then we have the base of the heart. So we're sort of at, uh, in the middle of the heart, but at this weird angle, or at this angle, that makes the heart actually feel like it's more on the left side of the body. So anatomically, position-wise, we're going to describe this as center of body below, or a better anatomy word, is deep to the sternum. So below or deep to the sternum. It's also going to be tilted to the left. This long axis gives it a left declination. Now, because it is tilted to the left, that means that, and we're going to find this out in more detail in just a few minutes, the ventricles, which distribute blood into the pulmonary circuit and into the systemic circuit, are affixed closer to the left side of the body. These are also the stronger pumping uh, uh, cavities in the heart. And so because the ventricles are pointed to the left, the heartbeat is much more prominent on the left side of the chest. So positional, it's going to be at that angle just below the sternum tilted left. The shape of the heart is going to be wide on the top. Now this is where it gets a little bit strange because we're talking about the top of the heart, but this wide top of the heart is going to be referred to as the base. So the base of the heart is actually here, this widened region towards the more um, superior portion of the heart. The heart narrows. And we get to a narrow bottom, 
that we are going to refer to as the apex, which actually means the top. But so apex is down here at the bottom of the heart. The base is up here at the top of the heart. So base does not refer to the bottom. Apex does not refer to the top. It's more of a shape designator based off of the, the, the wideness or narrowness of the heart in those areas. All right, the heart is covered. It has coverings, and we've already seen this with a few other tissues as well. Um, so here you're looking at the heart, uh, and, and specifically you should be noticing the coverings. So you got to really think of the heart being put inside of some sort of sac-like structure. And that sac-like structure is going to be referred to as pericardium. Okay, so we're encasing the heart in this thing called the pericardium. And, and actually what we're going to really begin to see is we have a couple different layers of pericardium that are going to get uh, a variety of different names. Overall, though, the pericardium is a fibrous tissue. So this is a very kind of um, tough covering around the heart. And the reason that it exists is it acts as a separation from other organs. And other structures in the thoracic cavity. And it's very important that this is intact and healthy because this is going to allow very efficient movement of the heart. And as the heart beats, it's going through a lot of movement, and it's going to need to expand and contract. And on average, this is happening at rest between 60 and 75 times a minute. The average heart uh, in a human is going to be 2.8 to 3 billion times in a lifetime. By having this protective layer over the heart, we're keeping the heart from rubbing constantly on those other organs. You don't have to really do too much, but just to simply rub your hands together for a while to know that that movement would eventually become very, very painful. We get very hot from the friction, and eventually it would start to actually wear the tissue away. Now, in addition to that protective mechanism, it also protects the heart. The pericardium protects the heart from overexpansion. As we fill up the ventricles in the atria with blood, it's just like filling up a water balloon. If you put too much water in a water balloon, eventually it's going to burst. And so the pericardium is actually going to have force back down, preventing an overfilling of the ventricles or the atria to prevent uh, any sort of damage to the heart tissue. <laughs> elephant in the room. <laughs> so looking at the pericardium, we have uh, several different uh, layers of the pericardium. And if we look at the outer wall, the pericardial sac pericardial sac is going to be known as the parietal pericardium. And you can see that here. There's actually even an, uh, a more outer layer that's fibrous. I'm going to just sort of connect those two together because I think it's acceptable to do that as the parietal pericardium. So this is going to be our outer 
our outer layer. Really, when we're looking at this, this is kind of taking like taking two Walmart bags and putting one inside the other one, and then putting the heart inside. And so you have an outer layer, and then you have kind of a space in between the outer layer and the inner layer, and then you'd have the heart. Why is that so funny? Comparing the heart to the Walmart bag. Just the pericardium to the Walmart bag. So outer wall is going to be the parietal pericardium, and then the inner wall is going to be associated with the visceral pericardium. The visceral pericardium can also be called the epicardium. So inner wall, visceral up, uh, pericardium, also known as the epicardium. And you can see that here, sort of highlighted in blue in this figure. The visceral pericardium or the epicardium lines the actual heart tissue. And then we have a space in between. Uh, but before I get there, on the apex of the heart, we're actually going to have a ligament. And this ligament is going to anchor the pericardium and the heart to the diaphragm. So anchors the pericardium and the heart to the diaphragm. And this is through a type of ligament. And this is actually pretty interesting. Um, during space flight, one of the things that happens is you have uh, a lot of times uh, lower body negative pressure, meaning that there's lower pressure in the lower body, higher pressure here. And that lower pressure, high pressure goes to low pressure. And when that happens, when we induce that experimentally or if we're in space, that ligament will actually begin to be pulled on. The diaphragm gets pulled on and begins to descend lower and lower in the body towards that lower pressure. And it pulls on that ligament, and the heart literally gets pulled down and sort of twisted in the cavity. you feel that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do notice it. Um, and is it safe? That's one of the reasons that they've done research to figure out how and if they can prevent that. And that's where, like, gravity suits and things like that have, have come out of to try to increase lower body pressure so we can eliminate or, or limit that effect. Yeah, it is terrifying. My heart feels like it's in my toe. <laughs> have you ever seen a simulating ride at I have not. I guess you probably not. <laughs> the experiment, the experimental design for those lower body negative pressure, it's it's the weirdest setup in the world. It's basically this big plexiglass plexiglass box, and you get in and, and it's like a spray skirt on a kayak, and they like seal you up really really tight. And you're laying there on a gurney, and you're like, I mean, it looks like a big iron lung, but it's around your legs. And then they just start vacuuming out air, a lot of times with a vacuum cleaner. And so it starts to induce lower pressure in, in, in that negative part, or the lower part of the body, on a negative pressure, and everything starts to just... Yeah, I was wondering, they tell you if you have any sort of heart problems, you're not allowed to ride. Well, if you have any sort of heart problems... It's like 15 to 9. <laughs> <laughs> That's like really scary. Your, your heart is about to be... Below your stomach, um, and if you have heart problems, you probably should exit now. And then they like slam the yeah. door straight <laughs> <in> really quick. <laughs> uh, all right, in the final minute here, in between the pericardium, and you can see that here in this figure, you have a cavity, and that's called the pericardial cavity. So the pericardial cavity. And we will pick up there uh, next time. <laughs>